Hello and welcome to the Future You podcast, where we interview professionals within the creative industries on their views of the visions of the future. I'm Ben. I'm Eleanor, and today we're joined by... Hi, I'm Simon. Brilliant. So, who are you and what area do you specialise in? Okay, so I'm um, a director of one of the top 25 architectural practices in the UK um, and work with about 200 staff across the country um, delivering architectural projects. Perfect. So the first proper question is, how would you say the world has changed since you started in the world of work or started in the world of architecture? So this includes your uni degree as well. Uh, probably probably massively, because um, when I, I, I started my degree in 1992, which was really on the cusp of digital technologies coming forwards. Um, I was really into digital technologies at that time. And out of a course of about 100 people, there was two of us that were interested in digital technology. So um, I actually utilised it through my de- degree course. But when I did my years out in practice, um, we were still working on drawing boards. We were still using rotary pens and pencils and things like that. Um, so it was it was fairly cutting edge then. But I could see the real potential it offered for architects for the future. Brilliant. So... Um... Architecture is obviously something, as you said, that has been affected majorly by sort of technology and innovation. You've gone from a very analog sort of way of doing things to now you do everything uh, pretty much digitally. Um, would you say sort of the the advent of all of this technology has made it easier or more difficult for you to do your job? And, you know, would you say that you prefer it to how you once did? Personally, yes, because I really enjoy it and I really enjoy the technology side of it um, that sits behind it all. Um, I think it, it's a really difficult question to answer. In many ways, it's made it a lot easier. We can do things a lot quicker. We can do things a lot smarter. Um, but actually, there was a lot of thinking time you used to get when you're on a drawing board. It would take you two or three days to produce a drawing on a drawing board. We can probably produce that drawing now in in a couple of hours. Um, And so you need to think quicker when you're working in that way. And sometimes, particularly with some of the the younger architects, they need that thinking time. So so they lose as a result of that. the other thing that we found is is clients expect a lot more as a result of it. You know, when when people knew it take you three days to produce a drawing, say, is it going to be they're not going to ask yeah. you for millions of drawings. Yeah. But but now it's it's instantly and there's a, there's a preconception that actually technology does a lot of it for mm-hmm. you. We still have to design a building. We still have to put that intellectual input yeah. into into a building. And clients are there saying, can we have this? Well, doesn't the computer just do it? You know, you can mm-hmm. deliver it for us. So so clients become a lot more demanding. We. If I look at the outputs that we produce now, we produce a lot more for our clients than Mm -hmm. we used to produce 20 years ago. So so on balance, it's probably about the same, Mm -hmm. but we do a lot more now than we used to do. And with the younger architects, will they have um, had any experience with the sort of analog traditional format, so the drawing, or is this something that actually is completely skipped? I'm talking the the likes that have just graduated. No, absolutely. Probably more so than you'd expect. I mean, yeah. schools of architecture, we were we were basically the, the ones that were hated for using technology. You know, technology was something that was going to constrain you. It was mm. going to make you really rigid in your design. Um, so our lecturers absolutely hated it. And I wrote two dissertations on the subject. Um, there was a really um, good group at MIT in America at the time, back in the 1990s. And this was back in the days when a plotter to print drawings used to pick up a pen and it used to, mm. to draw the drawing. Um, they they were getting real problems within the university there of their work not being accepted because a machine had done it for them. It wasn't mm-hmm. it wasn't creative. And they actually found out if they un, in, undid a bolt on the print head on the plotter and the pen wobbled, it looked like a hand-drawn <laughs> drawing. And all of a sudden they were accepted for it. Um, so there's still that kind of stigma within schools of architecture. They do do a bit more work with things like SketchUp for some more creative modelling, um, some things like uh, AutoCAD in, in terms of some of the drawings, but really not pushed as hard as it potentially could be. Mm. Um, so we find with the technology side of it, we end up training the staff more when they come into our business to use that and, and develop more. Brilliant. So would you would you say the changes in technology and innovation have had a positive impact on your career as a whole in or or, or would you prefer to almost take a step back and go to the 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 analog side of things that you started off in i think well i think to an extent we still do you know Mm. we we still sketch we still do those sort of things to to help us have that thinking time and think about a project so we've got the best of both worlds in many ways so i think it has it has really improved what we do um the other thing is for 
for what what you found historically with architects, you had a lot of people who are actually quite good artists doing mm. it. Yeah. Um, a lot of people think creatively, but can't necessarily translate that through Pen the hands paper, yeah. to drawing or whatever else. So actually, what the technology does is provides a bridge for that. So you can provide, you can produce some quite interesting information and convey it in a way that expresses mm. your your creative energies um, without having necessarily the skills that you'd have tr- traditionally needed to paint or to draw yeah. or things mm. like that. Do you, Do you think the technology clouds creativity sometimes, though? Because almost through drawing, you can you can sometimes, you know, come up with an idea and go, oh, this looks good. I like, yeah, like this that and do that again of... and do, you know do some more I know it's obviously if you're working through a brief that's less mm. you know you can't always do that but it is something that often just from having that human sort of uh, analog touch that you can come up with things and come up with creative ideas is that I think it depends how you think of technology you know all, mm. all it is is a tool and yeah. a, your pen's a tool if you think a drawing board in the old days was a tool mm. and that had a parallel motion on it, you, you slid up and down, yeah. you had mm. a set square that you did that. In many ways, that can control what you do. Yeah. So for me, it's about how you use that tool and yeah. how you how you use it. And you, it shouldn't make you any less creative. I think that's so interesting because um, that's what a few of our previous yes. um, yeah. people that we've interviewed have said. Yeah. Create, um, technology should be used as a tool within your creativity. It's not yeah, just based absolutely. on technology. It should work as a partnership. And I think a, a, lot, a lot is is how you view it. Yes, mm. you can use, you know, some of the software that we use to be really bland and boring mm-hmm. and create rectilinear boxes and things <laughs> like that because it allows you to do it. And sometimes you have to push, push the boundaries of the software a bit mm-hmm. more to, to do the more creative things you want to do. Yeah. But it's about you doing that and investing the time to do it and understand it. Because cool. I know before um, we started the podcast, you'd mentioned about a, a project that I think, Eleanor, you said looked like a porcupine, yes, didn't it you? it did look like a porcupine. And, and that will have obviously been done using computers. So it's it's would what would the process of coming up with that idea have been? Well, I think what? I think a really really good example is is um, we've worked historically with Will Allsop, very well world renowned architects. And he always used to start his projects with a painting wall in the office and he would create a painting of what what the building was going to be. But actually, his his buildings were probably some of the the wackiest, Mm. um, you know, obscure shaped solutions (laughs) in there. But what under Pinwheel's work is he is he had a lot of technology behind it and particularly his young team that worked with him around it were always modeling and creating and testing these things and it allows you to test them you know not just from a physical point of view of what as what it looks like but structurally will it work will it be strong enough will it stand up all those sort of things so in a sense the technology enabled that level of creativity that if you rewound 100 years you know you'd really struggle Mm. you look at historic buildings like cathedrals and things like that beautiful buildings but very much constrained by yeah. the the technical issues and the technical capabilities at the time so would you say that actually all of these sort of really wacky buildings have actually come about because of technology or would you just say it's it's uh, the change in design sort of I think I, I think there's all, there's always fashions and trends that mm-hmm. go through design I think the other the other big shift over over this century really is is the change in technology and construction and building materials. Mm. It's not just from a design side. You know, we can 3D print buildings. Um, the materials that we can work with allow us to be a lot more flexible in mm-hmm. terms of shape and form. Um, so, so I think technology has affected all of those things in in a big way to allow us to do things differently. Yeah. And just touching on the, the the materials and the 3D printing. How has that changed? Because I know you mentioned 3D printing. So what what is what is 3D? What how do you use 3D printing in so, architecture? So so these are, this is basically robots automating the construction process. So like a 3D printer that you'd have on your desk that prints a, an object. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're much bigger versions than that that print in um, special concretes and things like that to to actually build up the layers of a building and actually physically print a structure yeah um there's also lots of factory manufacture of, of building components now that we we bring together and put together so it's it's really kind of um industrializing and, and technologically um developing the systems that we build with do, do you think that because of uh, in both the, the building aspect and the designing aspect uh, do you think this sort of new technology and innovation does actually um sort of encourage new young budding architects to come into the um, sector or do you think that actually it's it's something that can push them away because they have to learn 
all of these softwares, which quite often can be quite difficult. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think architecture has always been attractive as a profession. Mm. Um, the, the, the disbenefit of joining it is you have to study for seven years to become one. Mm. So um, particularly in the current <laughs> world with tuition fees, it's mm-hmm. actually quite quite tricky Definitely. for people. But I think, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it is an exciting industry. We get to leave our mark on the world. Mm. You know, our buildings hopefully will be out there for, well, certainly, you know, 50 years, yeah. 100 years yeah. um, beyond us. So I think there's a lot of things and it's a very varied career in mm-hmm. terms of what you do throughout your your working day almost. So um, I don't think the technology would put people off. Like everything, you get people who are better at it than others mm-hmm. and, and people tend to find their groove within the industry in terms of what they're, they're good at and, and whether technology is something that actually really sort of benefits them and, and pushes them to the forefront in their career. Yeah, so... Um, in in terms of, we've obviously seen a, obviously seen a lot in the past few months about the the metaverse and this digital world. So, what are your opinions on? It, can architecture be uh, sort of included into this? You know, and and will there be a need for properly trained architects, or will anybody be able to do it? No, I think I mean, I think it's really, really interesting and exciting concept at the moment. You know, people are already hanging out in places in the metaverse. So so the ability to create architectural Mm. spaces in there. I think the other thing that's really attractive to to architects who are a bit more forward thinking is actually within the metaverse, you lose some of the constraints that you have in the Mm. in the real world. So, you know, things like gravity and structural strength and things like that. Um, You know, we've already got architectural practices designing space in the metaverse. Uh, I think, you know, one of the concepts we're looking at is buying space in the metaverse and actually producing buildings, towns and things like that, which I think allow you great creativity in terms of what you can do. So I think that the virtual world is becoming more and more attractive mm-hmm. than the than the physical yeah. world in many ways. Um, there was a project I did in, in 1994 that actually looked at this as a concept mm-hmm. um, that actually the real world space that you require gets less and less. You know, you need a space to sleep, you need a space to eat. Um, and a space to wash and and actually that's Mm -hmm. what your true need in this world is and actually if the virtual world is so much more exciting you know you could have an amazing place in the virtual world and just the thing that support your everyday living in the real world um so you know everyone can be a millionaire and Mm -hmm. live in a big mansion virtually but you can't necessarily do that in the physical world so but but for people that um don't understand the metaverse as you know as a whole, as an idea, why would architects still be needed for this? Why couldn't, you know, you, I go and just go, look, this is a, a very creative structure. <laughs> like, you know, why? I, th- I think, you know, it, it's it's like any professional in any, any format, isn't it? You know, even you go to an artist, not everyone can be an artist. Someone no. can have a go at it. Yeah. And, you know, some people might be quite good at it, mm. but not everyone's going to be able to do it. I think, you know, the the thing with the metaverse is obviously there'll be less regulation surrounding it and things like that. So in the real world, we have to comply with building regulations and planning and all those sort of technical aspects which which control our industry. In the metaverse, you don't have those. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it could actually be quite interesting with some non-architects designing spaces and buildings in the metaverse. Some will be awful, some may be (laughs) brilliant, you know, it's... But that's that's all part of it. And, you you know, people can all all grow and be inspired by some of those things. Yeah, And it could inspire um, architects as well, because if if people that, you know, are artists instead come up with an idea, it's then for the architect, they can put it into an actual physical, well, not physical because it's in the metaverse, but, you (laughs) know, a, a... I was going to say tangible, but not tangible either. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I think the bigger bigger aspect of the metaverse is is it means people thinking in a different way because you you're getting into understanding things on the blockchain network and and how things are owned within that space. You know, do people rent space? Do people physically own it? And it's it's a different concept to the real world. Um, so you know, you you could see architectural practices having a head of blockchain as part of their staffing an employee mm. to 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 actually manage that space. So again, technology sort of impacting on that as an industry. Yeah, and and um, sort of regarding the 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 education. So you said you've you've got seven years to get your degree. Uh, regarding that, do you think that technology can help to maybe reduce that course length in the future? So actually, 
as you said, it's it's could be it could mean that some people don't want to do it because it's seven years and tuition fees mm. and whatever. If if it was in fact, a, I know you can do architectural technology and that's a three or four year course, yep. is it? But it's not a fully fledged yep. architect. So if it was a shorter course, say three or four years, w- would more people? Um, I I I don't think technology will help with that because. It, it's actually about your understanding and thinking you develop over that period and, and actually looking at most architects who are newly qualified, mm-hmm. myself included, rewinding several years. <laughs> um, you actually don't know much at the point you leave, even having studied for seven years. The best thing you do during that seven years is you do a year out at year four uh, yeah. and you do a year out in, you, in your seventh year. And that's where you actually learn yeah. the real stuff. What we're seeing is more and more... Um, students looking at going down an architectural apprentice route which Mm. is something the RIBA have launched which actually gives them greater exposure to that technology so so they do it part-time it takes them longer to do it you're up to nearly 10 years to to study and do that apprenticeship but you're doing it in practice you're earning you're learning you're around a bunch of creative people doing it so actually you develop a lot more through that process because I'm just thinking how could you try and encourage more creativity so you mentioned architects like will Allsop, who, who are very like creative not really practical as such building you know architects um would how would you encourage more creativity through the the industry because a lot of it can always be quite um sort of practical i i, th- I think the architectural education has, has changed quite a lot over the years and they've They've certainly been trying to attract people who are from more of an arts background and, and to do it. It's it's always a big debate. Is architecture mm. a science or is it an art? Um, but I think certainly from an architectural education point of view, which is one of the reasons why I don't think they push technology that hard, um, is they've been trying to get more and more artistic people into the industry um, to deliver it. And I think that's that's kind of one of the things that makes it attractive, that you've got the ability to do that. You need to learn the skills along the way. Yeah. Um, and and what you are seeing is because you on the architectural course you get an option at the end of your degree to go a different route you know you could do a joint in town planning you mm. could do a joint in various other things what you're tending to find now is the less able architects or less less able architectural students are taking that alternative route at that point mm. so you're actually funneling the creative ones yeah. to to carry on with that career and develop and we get some very very good students come through through our business now and and how easy would you say it is for you to channel creativity through your profession because obviously if you're working to brief certain clients won't want that you know you can't go and make a a, a hedgehog shapes (laughs) building for i don't know the police or you know the ambulance So, so how how easy is it to implement creativity is that something that you can do constantly I, th- I think there's, there's creativity in in lots of ways within the industry you know one of the things is being creative in making a building mm. affordable you know and, and using different materials or forms to make so creativity doesn't have to be in the pure we're creating a brilliant piece of art yeah. it can be in lots of yeah. lots of different ways i mean what i would say is certainly in the last 20 years the world has become more and more design conscious so the industry is being forced to be more creative you know we have to go through uh, design review panels on on larger schemes with planning authorities um, and to do that you have to talk about the narrative of the building you know it's not just here's a building it's got yeah. four walls and we put some windows in it there's a story that always goes with the building mm. and, and actually having that really strong narrative which is part of that creative process um, in developing it and being able to sell that it gives authenticity to the design that you deliver mm. um, and and the world is making us do that more and more which can only be positive really brilliant so what what changes do you think we'll see in the future in your industry and will creativity continue to be something that is pushed and keep it keeps being pushed i know we've mentioned the metaverse but if we're sort of stepping away from that and thinking if that's not going to take over like Mm. we think it will and we continue having practical you know tangible buildings (laughs) um, then is is that something that will yeah, I, I think, you know, I think that w- one thing that we can predict is we can't predict what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we've seen that, you know, even over the last 10 years, mm-hmm. you know, some some massive changes in where we are. Um, I think architecture is a creative pro- pro- profession and it will continue to develop and evolve and adapt to those 
we do hopefully tend to be at the forefront of some of that technology and that development and those changes. Um, I do think the metaverse will have an impact on things, um, even if it's only how we communicate some of our information with with clients, with other people. You know, if what what we often forget as architects is our clients generally don't understand drawings. Mm. You know, we produce some quite technical drawings of how to, to how to build a building. And the amount of times in my early career when I've gone around a site and someone said, oh, I hadn't realised that. If we'd had a window in that bit, we'd have been able to yeah. see that. What what the technology is already allowing us to do is is our clients can virtually prototype their buildings before they're built. And actually those those lessons that you you learn going around and saying, oh, if we had a window there, you can actually put those windows in as part of the design process before it actually mm -hmm. gets built. So I think that's incredibly positive in terms of our clients being able to understand more about what their building is going to be. Um, and allow us to develop something for them. So, so, and I think that will continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. You know, we, the last two years have actually proved us that we can work remotely. You know, we've got 13 offices around the country mm -hmm. and I, I'm working with individuals in five or six of those, you know, and it might be once every two months I go and sit in the office with them, yeah. but we share stuff on screen. We work together with our clients, with the contractors we work with, all of that technology is changing the way we work mm -hmm. um, and you're making us environmentally better as well. Yeah, exactly. We don't have to travel. I, I had a project um, down in Exeter and every time I went to visit it, it was a 330 mile round trip. Um, it was one of the reasons I swapped to an EV at that mm. point was because I was burning loads of diesel going up and down all mm. the motorway all the time and it actually guilt tripped me into changing <laughs> the way I behave as a result of it. So, um, you know, all of these things will keep evolving and changing for us and hopefully for the better. Yeah. And and just, I know you mentioned about um, modelling and the clients are able to see uh, what their buildings look like. What about sort of um, VR and 360 yep. degree technology? Is that... Yeah, abso absolutely. I mean, one one of the contractors we work with in, in Birmingham, they have a BIM cave in their in their um, in their offices, and and the BIM cave is a space like this. We can load our model into it. You can stand in the middle of it, and you can walk around that building, mm. and you can see everything in there. Um, it's quite interesting. I actually feel quite queasy from <laughs> yeah, in that. Yeah. So, but but it's a great technology where again they can experience that that building. Yeah. Um, you can do some scary stuff with VR as well. You know, we've 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 done some of the things with our VR goggles where we're we're at high level in big open spaces in buildings with nothing underneath <laughs> you, and and it really freaks people out when you look at that sort of stuff. So, um, but yeah, it's 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 all about how we communicate our medium to people, and and all of that those things make it much easier than a drawing does. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, touching on all of this sort of augmented reality, virtual reality, all of this stuff. Do you think that there's a place that, well, not a place for, but possibly in the future that artificial intelligence you, you might take over in a sense? Because actually you can say, look, put a brief sort of um, explanation of what you want into some software and it goes, look, here's your building. Mm. We're, yeah. we're, we're already actually working in that way at the moment. Yeah. There's... there's um, certainly what we call parametric design, where some of the software we work with, if it's something that you, you regularly design, like say a, um, an apartment block or something like that, you know the maximum size of an apartment block, you know how far the stair course can mm. be, and it will actually start to assemble that in there. It still needs creative input yeah. to, to shape it, obviously on the site and things like that. Yeah. But like. but what, what we're trying to do is use technology more and more to automate the tasks that doesn't need that creative yeah. input you know it's the it's the stuff that you know almost spreadsheet mm -hmm. stuff it's it's working out the maximum um the optimum fit for a site and things like that so yeah it's it's, it's already getting there in terms of that automation so that goes back to what you said earlier about actually um the creativity the creative input is much mm -hmm. more because you can focus on the creative stuff yeah, rather than the, the practical um side yep. of things and do you think because um obviously the people we've interviewed in the past often view AI as quite a negative thing, would you say? I, I think it's quite gathered. mixed, wasn't it? Yeah, like it's, it to was, a point, yeah. it's cool, yep. but yeah. then they're always like, you know, this is a little bit hesitant negative sort of and thing, yeah. What about in your profession? Would you say, actually, this is this could be a negative thing, or do you think the more AI, the better? I, I, think, I think it's people's, you know, people don't like change, mm -hmm. and people don't like things being different, and that was, that was the issue when digital technology came into design and architecture. 
I think people don't understand AI yet. Mm -hmm. You know, and AI used in the right way for the right things that makes your life easier. Yeah. Why wouldn't you yeah, do it? Exactly. You know, it's. Um, I think if if someone's perceiving AI of, as you know, you can give it to someone else and plug some numbers in and it'll design a building yeah. for you. Well, yeah, that is that is negative, but it's not. It's yeah. never going to be that because. You know, it, every building out there is different, and every yeah. building out there is different because a lot of it comes from yeah. here, yeah. and it's it. That's what you're paying for when you buy a, you pay for a creative professional design a building. Mm. I think a lot of the time, all of um, this, you know, AI that the computers behind it lack, they can't almost be creative themselves. That well, at the end of the day, like I think um, Beck was saying, mm. they're on and off, aren't they? Yeah. They they don't have all of those other processes we have in our in our, in our yep. brains they can't almost process that. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the other thing that's interesting on that is is looking at simulation as well. We're doing a lot more simulation in buildings in terms of um, thermal performance of buildings, in terms of fire and fire evacuation of buildings, and that stuff's perfect for AI. Mm. It's, it's, it's those simulations to test how something could work in reality. Yeah. The other thing we find with our, our building models that we create, which we build from, um, is is our clients are then using them for different things. So they'll use them for training. So they can they can use them training people. Mm. So rather than taking them around an operational building, they can do all their training in the virtual world before yeah. they go into there. They use them for maintenance. So their their facilities management providers will go around and they'll have the model and they'll know in any room what that light bulb yeah. is and where you buy it from and how much it costs and everything else. So there's a lot more intelligence being brought into the, the construction industry generally as a result mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, and that and that leads me on to, um, do you think sort of the evolution of technology and, and innovation is something that does, does allow creativity to evolve um, into something much greater than it already is? And yeah. Ab absolutely, you know, the, the fact that we wouldn't have even imagined even 10 years ago, yeah. that you're using the design information that you created to look after and maintain yeah. and potentially ultimately demolish a building yeah. at the end of its life. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's had a, a massive impact on that. And, and when you first started, so uh, you first started your degree, would you have thought that we would have progressed as much as we have? Like, what was your sort of prediction on how the industry would be yep. back then? It's it's a funny one because in in many ways the the infrastructure that supports the technology the computers and the PCs mm -hmm. I thought would have evolved at a much faster rate than they have. Yeah, really? you know I can remember sitting there thinking, okay, my machine which was this big sitting <laughs> on my desk with a nine inch screen on it, um, thinking in five years time, wow, I'll be able to do this way quicker. Yeah. yeah. What we found is 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 actually that speed development hasn't happened. The complexity of what mm -hmm. they do has got better, but it hasn't really speeded things up a huge mm. amount over that period. Um so so yeah it's I think something we can relate to is obviously we render videos and you render buildings. Mm -hmm. So it's just the rendering process as a whole and that still is a long process. Well, I know it however, much... in 1992, it took 32 days oh, yeah. to render a, a building image that was 640 by 480 pixels. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it has sped so, up, so <laughs> has sped up quite a but lot. But even so, we're still having to take multiple hours out yeah. of our Absolutely. working lives. And that's not, for 30 years development... Yeah, all, all, although things like the cloud are making things yes. a lot better, so we can use render farms in the cloud yeah. now, um, and, oh, and a lot of that depends on <laughs> how much money you're willing to pay on yeah. it. You know, we, we could get renders produced in, you know, minutes if we use a very expensive render farm solution yeah. um, that's that's using, you know, 30, 40, 50 PCs to, to come together to render your image. Yeah. If we're doing it on a single PC in our office, yeah, it'll take hours to render, hours. you know, mm -hmm. maybe leave it overnight running and yeah. rendering. Um, when we come to rendering animations, a bit bit like you rendering movies, um, you know those can take yeah. days yeah. In, in theory if you're doing a really large animation, and and that's probably still at the point we do tend to outsource some of that stuff. Yeah. We might model it and build the model and everything else, but then say to someone mm -hmm. else, can you do the renders for mm -hmm. us because it's just the infrastructure we'd need to render very quickly on those as a business we can't support. Yeah. So. And what about other than the computer side of things? How how would you have thought it would have pro progressed? Um, I mean, it's... It, in design, 
in yeah i mean des- design wise um we we still kind we still think the way we used to think yeah. we still do the things we 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 do what we have is all these bolt-ons around us and everything you know i wouldn't have thought 20 years ago that we'd be walking around site with a site manager with an ipad taking photos and recording bits and stuff on the on yeah. site and and you know then when you get back to the office he sent you a report yeah. with all of that stuff on so that's really kind of speeded stuff up in terms of how we we deal with things um but yeah it's hope it will it will keep evolving it will keep getting smarter you know we've already talked about you know, do we end up in a position in the future where we're using drones to do virtual site yeah. inspections? Again, not needing to travel to a site. Yeah. If there was a drone and a, a video link to that, you can do everything we do when we go and look around a building and it could Very be that, yeah. in another country. It could be, you know, it doesn't have to be here in the UK. And I mean, I know we've talked about um, how uh, the architectural industry will look in the future, but how do you think the creative industries as a whole will look? This can be media and just as, a, as your opinion, your own opinion. I think I think there's a big shift in everything. I think there's a big shift in how people buy stuff and pay for stuff. Yeah. You know, you take television as a medium. You know, if 20 years ago you had four channels and, mm-hmm. and you paid your TV license and you watched it on there, two of those were commercialised, so that was how they were funded, but that was it. Now, if you look at online streaming and subscription platforms and everything else, I think the way we do everything, you may even see that come into architecture. Yeah. You know, do 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 people pay for you to design a single building and do it do you do you start buying stuff off the shelf yeah. you know is the is the models you can buy for things to to deliver these things and i think the world will continue to evolve yeah. in that way it's... Yeah, that's brilliant and and do you think that the changes that we have experienced in the creative industries as a whole so we're talking you know, even down to cameras and all of that do you think it's a positive thing or do you think sometimes it can be a negative thing because in many ways it makes it very accessible. Mm. It makes it very accessible. I think I think it's positive in terms of what you can do with yeah. it all, how you can use it, you know, yeah. the ability to do that. Even being here today doing that yeah. is a prime example yeah. of that. You know, you'd have needed a film studio and hundred thousand yeah. exactly. pounds worth of kit <laughs> yeah. twenty yeah. years ago to do that. So And it still wouldn't have it, been as it good does. quality. <laughs> you know, as as you'll all have experienced, technology can be incredibly frustrating yeah. at times. You know, we we've just had an issue on one of our projects because of how uh, a building was modelled and drawn that mm. we've not been able to use it and that was a technology failure on us um, you know we've had server failures over mm. the years I can remember going back nearly 20 years ago we had our whole server fall over in the office and this was in oh, the day of, of dial-up modems and things like that and suddenly our backup failed as well and we were facing where's all our work gone what are we going to do you know and it's <laughs> if it was a paper drawing you'd have pulled it out pulled the cupboard out, yeah. and you made another copy of it so it, it can be a barrier on a number of mm. occasions. It can be really frustrating. It certainly costs us all a lot more to, as, as an industry to manage some of these yeah. things, but it, it does allow people to also do it at home. So, yeah. On a side note, as this is a podcast and we can, <laughs> we can talk, how did it get knocked over? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm quite interested to know. No, it didn't physically oh. fall over, it <laughs> fell over technologically. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. I, I was hard, thinking. Hard drive sale. I was thinking it. someone bumped into it or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just someone on, on the T run. And, <laughs> and so, uh, as a whole, and this doesn't have to be in architecture, what technolo- no- technological advancements are you a fan of, both in architecture and outside? And it can all relate. <laughs> Um, I, to be honest, I just love technology. So, yeah. so the the ability to see things differently, the ability to access p- things differently, the ability mm. to communicate differently. Yeah, you know, we we get to see more. You know, one of one of the things in architecture you 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 thrive on is what others do. You know, you see so and so's done that great building, yeah. isn't it amazing what they did with this cladding system or you know the form they made on that corner of the building. Actually, unless it was captured in an architectural magazine 20 years ago, that yeah. would have been the only yeah. way you see it. Yeah. Whereas actually now it's in Instagram and Pinterest mm-hmm. and all those sort of things, YouTube. And, and we what what we're evolving in, in how we present the buildings that we've created now is is historically we'd have been very architectural in how we captured them you know it would be a professional photograph mm-hmm. um by a photographer who goes out there you know we capture stuff of stuff's being built and that gets shared, shared across the practice on teams so people see things being built we tend to think more about the lifestyle and and what it creates for the people that we're we're building mm-hmm. those building and spaces for um so actually capturing that and being able to sell that to people so that technology's changed in the way we sell our stuff as well from a marketing point of view so and and is 
are, are you a fan of all the technology that you have in your like your life that helps you to be who you are and to do your job how you do it yeah i, li- I like most of the technology we deal with some of it can be frustrating yeah. from time to time when new technology comes in it's always a burden you know when yeah. w- software changes regularly we revit which is probably the most the, the biggest soft piece of software we use for for design work and delivering our drawing work and models um that gets updated every 12 months from Autodesk and every time it comes out there's different features yeah. there's different ways of doing so you're constantly having to evolve and learn learning's good and that's what makes yeah. life interesting mm-hmm. but actually the frustration when you switch from one version to another and we're on tight deadlines and we're trying yeah. to get stuff out can actually be a frustration as well so and do you think this is something that might improve in the future so as new programs come out you know in the next 30 years we've talked about the past 30 years maybe in the next 30 years it takes less to learn because it's it's already becoming I think, so much more automated yeah, yeah. tasks for done well, uh, for you and you know we, we still accept that the way we communicate with the software is by a mouse and a keyboard mm-hmm. you know same with video editing same with yeah. everything you know maybe in the next 20 years we actually get to a point where thought actually controls it and i think that's when creativity really opens up you know that you you're not constrained by pick my mouse up move there Mm -hmm. click this do that you know if if you're actually you can capture your thoughts and imagination virtually into a machine i don't know how i've not got the the (laughs) technological answer to solve that (laughs) but i think that's that's when suddenly it steps to another level Mm -hmm. and actually you then lose the does technology constrain you? Because actually, all it's doing is capturing the thoughts yeah, in your mind to deliver happen, it. So. Yeah. And if you did have the answer, you'd be set for life. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. so, which leads me on to our final question, which is, does the future excite you or scare you? <laughs> <laughs> which everyone has that reaction. <laughs> well, it's, I, I mean, it's interesting. When, when I go back to the, um, the piece of work I did back at university in the 1990s, yeah. um, I actually spoke about uh, a society where we have a served and a servant community where the virtual world was so brilliant you needed very little Mm. in the real world and we had a community living in pods but obviously within those pods you had to have um, people delivering stuff you needed food hence the servant community actually if you think about the last two years that's pretty much what we ended up with Mm. you know okay it was within our house but all our communication was virtual Mm -hmm. um you know, Ocado and Tesco's and Asda and everyone else delivered the food to your house. You didn't leave your house. So, I, and and actually, when I gave that presentation, a load of my fellow students at the time came out of it and said, I'm never going to have a mobile phone now. <laughs> I, I don't want this world. It's yeah. scary. You know, we're, we're kind of becoming prisoners. Um, it was interesting to see how the world changed to kind yeah. of become yeah. that. So I think it does excite me. I think there's always fears and dangers. You know, you look at films like Terminator and things yeah. like that of, of what <laughs> the world could become. Yeah. And I think it's it's up to us and, and probably more so your generation yeah. as well to make sure that it is a good thing and mm-hmm. a positive thing because yeah. it could go the other way. Yeah. Um, but only we as mankind can yeah. can really dictate that. Yeah, and, and do you think that it's... Um, that it, it could quite easily go the wrong way or do you think that there's enough good in the world to make sure that that isn't the case it all comes down to who controls it doesn't <laughs> yeah. it you know that's well, exactly. fun- fundamentally and, and and how much i think you know the community has a much bigger voice than it probably had yeah um in the past you know social media is a really good way mm-hmm. for people to get their way you can look at some of the the current campaigns and lobbyists and things out there they wouldn't have been able to do to the level they've done yeah so i think if if the world believes it's going the wrong way, I think the world will tell the world yeah. it's going the yeah. wrong way. Um, and we've got the medium to do we that have now. So, yeah. We have so much reach. We can yeah. Absolutely. You know, reach everyone. So that's, shall we wrap up? Yeah. All right, that's been brilliant. So thank you very much for joining us. And thank you to Simon for joining us on the podcast today. It was been, it's been very good and very insightful. <laughs> and you can join us for more episodes. And you can also look down on our channel for more episodes as we have a few backlogged. So thank you very much for joining, listening and watching, and we'll see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.